Hello everyone, thank you very much for tuning in to one of my videos. My name is Luke and today we will be talking about how despawning enemies change Dark Souls 2. Let's get started. The gameplay loop of the Dark Souls series goes like this. You spawn as a bonfire and you move through the level killing enemies until you face a boss. When you defeat that boss a new level opens up and you continue on your journey killing enemies and facing the next boss. If at any point you are killed by any of these enemies you respawn at the last bonfire you rested at. All of the enemies respawn as well, minus bosses and other special enemies, and you have to fight your way back to where you died, where you can collect the souls that you dropped and continue on your way. Dark Souls 1 and 3 are identical in this respect, minus a few small details. Dark Souls 2, however, has one massive difference. In Dark Souls 2, enemies stop respawning once you have killed them enough times. I'm not sure on the exact number, but it's somewhere between 10 and 15, and this changes the game completely. The biggest impact that this design decision has is on level design and ensuing enemy placement. The ripple effect goes a long way, touching almost every aspect of the game, but it starts here. Let me explain. Once From decided that their game was going to have enemies who stopped respawning eventually, they were able to become less rigorous with their level design and enemy placement. Taking the idea to an extreme, it meant that theoretically they could place 100 enemies between bonfires, or between bonfires and boss fog doors, because the player could just gradually chip at that number until the enemies ceased to spawn. Imagine 100 enemies between you at the undead Berg bonfire and the Taurus Demon fog door in Dark Souls 1. Imagine how fun that gauntlet wouldn't be. Now imagine that those 100 enemies don't despawn once you have killed them enough times, and you begin to understand how delicately balanced enemy numbers and placement are in the Souls games. Dark Souls 2 ruins this balance because in some areas the game doesn't actually expect you to fight your way through the gauntlet of enemies to the next bonfire or the next fog door in one go. The game is designed to force the player to grind the enemies until they stop spawning. Let me give you an example. Heidi's Tower of Flame is an area that is open to the player as soon as they get to Majula. There is one bonfire that is used as a base for the run on the two bosses in the area. The run on the Dragon Rider has seven big heavy hitting enemies between the bonfire and the boss door. The run on the old Dragon Slayer has ten, though one of these is a dragon who doesn't spawn again after you kill him once so he won't count him. If you kill the Dragon Rider before the old Dragon Slayer then the Heidi Knights which were sitting around not doing much are up and about and now there are 11 enemies between you and the old Dragon Slayer. Now this isn't a problem in itself until you consider that the level design forces the player to fight each enemy every time. Heidi's Tower is an old ruin of a castle collapsing into the sea. The area is full of narrow walkways with deadly falls into the churning water at every turn. In the centre of the level is a circular area with two of the massive old knights blocking the two branching paths. The area is full of these choke points, each with one of these huge enemies guarding it. Running past them just isn't an option. They have to be put down if the player wants to proceed. There are some enemies that can be run past, but more often than not doing so means that you end up facing down an enemy that can't be run past. And now you are fighting two huge enemies that will crush you because their attacks layer through each other. Believe me, I've tried to cheese it past these guys and it just doesn't work. The old knight's weapons have incredible reach and there is one right in front of the Dragon Rider boss door. You can probably get to the door, but the animation that takes you through it allows the conga line of enemies chasing you to catch up and smash you to pieces. The dragon outside the old Dragon Slayer boss door poses the same problem and I'll let this footage speak for itself. Even if you do manage to book it past these enemies and beat the boss, they'll be sure to punish you for ignoring them just when you are basking in the satisfaction of a fight well fought. All of this would be frustrating enough without adding the fact that this is an early game area. Players are probably encountering this level with low stats and weapons which makes the grind more grindy. You might argue that players can simply come back with better weapons and stats later. This is true but only for so long. Relatively quickly the player gets to the point where they have to beat Heidi's Tower to unlock the rest of the game. Beating the Dragon Rider introduces the player to an NPC who opens up the path to Huntsman's Cops. No Man's Wharf and the whole other half of the Lost Bastille are beyond the Dragon Rider as well. This is almost beside the point however. On my first run through of the game I ground each enemy in Heidi's Tower until they stopped spawning. On my second run through with 250 hours of experience with From's games behind me I still had to grind them until they stopped respawning. You might argue that this is just one example, an anomaly in an otherwise well designed game. Well I can think of at least two other areas off the top of my head where I had to stop enemies spawning before I could carry on with the game. 
The gauntlet running up to the executioner's chariot fighting the undead purgatory is one. Nine enemies stand between the bonfire and the fog door, ten if you include the red phantom, and half of those are the executioner enemies. They don't take much to put down, but they hit hard, and facing more than one at a time is a death wish. The area is quite narrow, and you are supposed to isolate each enemy and fight him alone. Sometimes this works, and then other times it just doesn't, and I don't know why. I tested how possible it is to just cheese it past these guys as well. I'll put a montage here of how successful that was. Once again, running past isn't the problem, it's getting through the fog door before your enemies have a chance to catch up with you and murder you to death. The third area is in the Iron Keep and the gauntlet between the Threshold Bridge Bonfire and Smelter Demon Fog Door. There are, no joke, about 20 enemies standing in your way. 20. And like in Heidi's Tower, there are narrow walkways over lakes of molten lava for you to fall into if you aren't careful. The AI isn't above freaking out and sending your enemies into the flames as well though, so there is that. I defy anyone to fight their way through this gauntlet reliably and reach the boss fog door with enough Estus charges to stand even the smallest chance against the demon. It isn't just the sheer numbers of enemies, it's their placement as well. In the three examples I've given you are very rarely fighting fewer than two enemies at a time. This is fine in the case of the centre structure in Heidi's Tower where you have to fight one enemy before the other two join in once he is defeated. The arena is large and you are supposed to dodge and weave between the two to defeat them. That is it though. In almost every other instance you are fighting in narrow areas where your weapon bounces off of walls while enemy weapons clip right through and against enemies that hit hard and move fast, faster even than you can move. I mentioned earlier that attacks clip through character models as well so it can be difficult to see what attacks are coming. All of these things together make for a frustrating and dare I say it even unfair experience for the player. But that experience would be a lot more frustrating if the enemies didn't despawn. I asked you to imagine what Dark Souls 1 would have been like with more enemies. Now imagine what Dark Souls 2 would be like without despawning enemies. Imagine having to fight through all these guys every single time you are making a run on the boss. You see where I'm coming from. There is a further impact that the change in enemy placement has. This is the change that it has on the relationships that encounters with individual enemies have within themselves and within the level itself. Let's go back to Firelink Shrine and Dark Souls 1 and the trip up into the Undead Berg. Six or seven enemies stand between you and the tunnel with the Undead Rat. You face off against each enemy and they come at you one at a time, but you have to be aware of the enemies nearby in case you stray too close to them and get them involved in the fight as well. Each encounter is as much a test of your combat skill as it is your spatial awareness, and this consideration has to be made each time that you approach, regardless of how far you are through the game, what your stats are like, etc. Each individual fight forms part of a larger ecosystem of several encounters. These ecosystems can be quite easily identified throughout the game. The encounters between the Firelink Shrine bonfire and the tunnel with the undead rat form one. From the stairs leading up into the berg itself to where you first see the drake is a second one. Just past the drake to the undead berg bonfire is a third. The courtyard with the pig of the undead parish, the hollows and the channel are just before the bell gargoyles. The knights in the hall leading up to Ornstein and Smell, the trolls outside the Quaylag fight. All of these points are collections of encounters which interact with each other. Engaging with one usually requires engaging with all of the rest, and they are difficult to remove individually without having an impact on the larger system as a whole. Now let's consider Heidi's Tower in Dark Souls 2, an area that is broadly equivalent in terms of its place within the game to Firelink Shrine. Again, you face off against each enemy, and again they come at you one at a time, and you have to be careful not to stray into the next combat arena in case you aggro the enemy waiting for you. And here is where Dark Souls 2 defers from Dark Souls 1. The old knights in Heidi's Tower have their own specific areas in which you are supposed to fight them. They are completely isolated from the other encounters in the level because the developers knew that there would be a hypothetical point at which encounters would begin to be removed as enemies started despawning. The ecosystem of encounters that Dark Souls 1 has don't make sense if you remove even one of the smaller fights that contribute to the greater whole. Dark Souls 2 gets around this problem by not having them be related in the first place. This design choice affects almost everything in the game. Levels can be larger, more sprawling, with fewer bonfires because more enemies can be placed within them. Doing so places less emphasis on the tight level design of the first half of Dark Souls 1. This means less of a need to utilise shortcuts because players can just grind enemies, though the sprawling levels also make it hard to design in shortcuts in the first place. All of this makes the game more linear in general, which goes back to my previous video and the point I made about the things betwixt being a microcosm of the rest of the game. 
Larger, more horizontal levels with larger numbers of enemies meant that changes had to be made to the healing system. This could have been done in any number of ways, from increasing the size of health bars, to decreasing the amount of damage enemies deal, to increasing the number of Estus charges the player receives at each bonfire as standard, to introducing a new item that is available in enough numbers that it can be a reliable source of healing, to increasing the amount of damage attacks do so that players can put down enemies quicker, to name a few. From preserved the delicacies of the combat mechanics themselves by finding the solution in the healing items themselves. Players are given a single Estus flask by the Emerald Herald when they arrive in Medulla, and additional flasks are discovered by exploring the world. Sublime Bone Dust is used to increase the amount of health each Estus Flask provides. Life Gems are introduced as an additional source of healing, and can be bought from traders throughout Jan Lake and are pretty common to discover while exploring. They come in a couple of different forms, each offering different amounts of healing. The standard Estus Flask heals 550 hit points relatively quickly, but the player can't move while they are using it. The standard Life Gem heals 500 hit points over 10 seconds or so, but the player can still move, though at walking speed. The fully upgraded Estus Flask heals 800 hit points, the strongest life gems heal 1300 hit points over 29 seconds. There are tactical considerations to make between both types of healing, but the choice often comes down to how much time you have to use your selected healing item before your enemy attacks again. I think this final point really brings me to what I'm trying to say with this video. Despawning enemies is the most crucial difference between Dark Souls 2 and all the other Souls games, including Bloodborne and Sekiro. It changes so much about the game in very easily measurable ways. Now, I'm not saying that this change makes Dark Souls 2 better or worse than any of the other games in the series. I'm just trying to look at how a small change in design can have a large effect and how far the reach of that effect can stretch. What I will say is that despawning enemies in Dark Souls 2 makes me appreciate all the more how delicately balanced the level design in Dark Souls 1 and 3 is, which is a nice little clue as to my own private opinions about Dark Souls 2 in the broader Souls context. But that is for another video. Thanks for watching. Hi guys, thanks so much for taking the time to listen and hear me out till the end. I've had my chance to talk, so what are your opinions? Have I missed something? Am I completely hopelessly wrong? Is there some nuance that I am missing that might make my argument stronger? Put your thoughts in the comments, engage with me on Twitter, maybe even make your own video in response to mine. Either way, I hope you enjoyed listening to what I had to say. The next video is not going to have anything to do with the Souls games, I promise. In fact, we'll be turning our eyes away from the darkness of Drang Lake completely, turning them skywards, and talking about how shields change everything in Bioshock Infinite.